This webinar is titled Reinsurance, Examining Its Origins, Evolution, and Impact on Solvency. And it features the expertise of Dr. James Hilliard, Associate Professor with the Fox School of Business at Temple University, and Mr. William Arfanis, Division Director, Financial Regulatory Affairs with the Connecticut Insurance Department. Originally delivered to a live audience of both on-site attendees and webinar participants, this session originated from the campus of Illinois State University. It's a collaborative effort of the Institute's Griffith Insurance Education Foundation, the Insurance Regulator Education Foundation, and the Katie School of Insurance at Illinois State. In keeping with the respective missions of these organizations, this session is purely instructional in nature and does not support a position on any issues. This is the quote that I wanted to focus on from what I just recited to you. Antonio says, my ventures are not in one bottom trusted. Bottom is the Shakespearean word for ship, right? It's the hull of the ship. He's not sad about his merchandise. He doesn't have the same thoughts that Saul Reno had about, you know, watching the sand flow through the hourglass and thinking about the beaches that his ships might wind up on. He's not thinking about the stone base of the church and the cliffs that his ship might bounce up on. Because if that happened to his ship, he's got a few more ships in the sea, right? So uh, the idea that Shakespeare puts out that, um, that Antonio's sadness comes from something other than his uh, uh, commercial ventures is one that I like us to think about in the context of what reinsurance does for insurance companies. So I want to talk a little bit about the origins of risk management. Some of this is things that you might be familiar with. This uh, uh, sketch is from the tomb of Mena, uh, a pharaoh in Egypt around 1420 before the Common Era. What you can see if you look at this is some harvesters harvesting grain and storing. And this calls to mind for me the biblical story of Joseph, who had some dreams about what was going to happen in Egypt and then was charged by Pharaoh to sort of tax everyone's grain, set it aside to save for what they believe was going to be seven years of famine. And there's a whole uh, Hebrew narrative about what happens to Hebrew people because of Joseph's stewardship and risk management and setting things aside. And I think about that story as a risk management tool, and I wonder if financial markets had been more well developed if Joseph and Pharaoh might have come from a different scheme for risk management. And when I think about sort of the origins, I think where, where else do we see some development of what's going on in risk management and the financial aspects of risk management? And this woodcut comes from early pictures of the Lloyd's Tavern in London. And Lloyd's was a very early place where, not unlike Shakespeare's story, ship owners and investors would come together and in that facility, in that place, sort of identify ships that needed backing so that the individual ship owner would not be fully exposed to what was going on. And so Lloyd, the owner of the tavern, started keeping track of what was going on, made a little newsletter called Lloyd's List, posted it on the board. And as uh, the investors came in and negotiated and bargained with the ship owners, they would participate by pledging financial support to the venture, and they would write up a contract, and at the bottom of the contract, they would sign that contract with their name. And that signature at the bottom of the page became known as underwriting. They were writing their name under the contract. We, of course, know that underwriters persist as a part of the profession and the vocation that we're looking at today. So derivatives have been a part of financial transactions and uh, risk management and risk diversification for a very long time. Uh, it helped us fund the Crusades, helped fund wars uh, throughout the, the Dark Ages, through the, uh, uh, the Enlightenment, and then uh, very, very famously the use of uh, Dutch auctions and selling tulips and other merchandise in, in Holland. Uh, was the use of derivatives. Derivatives is basically any asset whose value is derived from the value of another asset. And so when I think about insurance, I think of insurance as simply a derivative whose uh, insurance contract's value is derived from the value of the uh, service or the liability exposure or the property that's being underwritten. Uh, and it pays off when that value changes, right? And so insurance is a derivative contract. And so Lloyds of London sort of uh, formalized that derivative contract and then it moved into the industrial, helped help support the uh, emergence of the industrial revolution, allowing people to diversify their assets across uh, industries. So that sort of gives us sort of a background. I, that may not be new information for you. Maybe it's a little different perspective than you've seen before, but I, I use that to set up sort of the very specialized form of risk management that we call reinsurance and talk about where it came from. I'll spend a few minutes talking about where it came from. Then I'm gonna talk about four academic reasons that scholars have pointed out that reinsurance makes sense. And then I'm going to talk about some actual terms for reinsurance before I pass it off to Bill, who will talk about the regulatory impacts. 
that's where we're headed. Uh, early uh, reinsurance companies in Europe included uh, Cologne Re in 1846, Swiss Re in 1863, Munich Re in 1880. These firms exist still today. Uh, but the reinsurance boom was fueled by uh, urban fires that happened in Europe around those times, urban fire of London, Humber, of uh, Glarus. Uh, reinsurance for life insurance, as opposed to uh, property insurance, expanded further uh, uh, prior to the American Civil War. In the United States, there was reinsurance going back before the Revolutionary War. Uh, it was not widely uh, used, but it was used, and it faced some challenges about which uh, state was uh, authorized to sell reinsurance and which states were, had different rules that applied. But the New York Supreme Court ruled in the late 19th century that uh, essentially reinsurance was fine, but reinsurance only identified the primary insurer and did not necessarily identify the, the policyholder uh, at the end. And that was a significant uh, role for if reinsurance was protected in that they were only indemnifying the insurer and then not responsible for, I guess what we would now call cut through, not responsible for indemnifying the policyholder, that it was easier for reinsurance to actually understand how to price their business. Uh, foreign reinsurers were admitted to the U.S. Uh, uh, insurance business uh, just before the turn of the 19th century, 20th century. Uh, it provided stability for natural disasters, including the St. Louis, uh, the San Francisco fire, the, the sinking of the Titanic in 1912, uh, World War I, and uh, the 1918 influenza pandemic. And as I was putting this together, uh, looking at notes from prior presentations like this, I said, what, what effect did it have on the 2020 pandemic? And the reality is that the 2020 pandemic had a lot of issues associated with business interruption, most of which have been settled in favor of the insurer. But there were also, there's a lot of reinsurance and catastrophe securitization on form of reinsurance I'll talk about later, focused on mortality risk. And so that reinsurance or that, that securitization would have applied to uh, the, uh, the use of mortality risk uh, reinsurance. But during World War II, it, 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 sometimes people wonder, why is Swiss Re so big? Why did Swiss Re sort of command and dominate the marketplace for reinsurance? The reality is that when uh, funding reinsurance policies Insurers were looking for uh, insurers domiciled in places that were not involved in the global conflict. And Switzerland famously is a place that doesn't get involved, and so Switzerland ended up uh, becoming dominant because of their lack of engagement in the military conflicts. Give you an idea of what the marketplace looks like today. Um, the S&P Global Reinsurance highlights uh, every year publishes the reinsurance position for companies. These top five have been the top five ever since I've been studying reinsurance. They trade places from time to time. Berkshire Hathaway reused to be generated, it's purchased by Berkshire Hathaway, um, early, 20th, early 21st century. Uh, if you add these up, you figure out that the, the top five carriers were about $170 billion worth of premium, which is more than half of the premium that the top 40 were. So it's really high concentration in these five companies, most of which you would recognize uh, that provide a lot of coverage. Munich Re has taken over Swiss Re uh, since the last uh, time I looked at these data. But that gives you an idea. These are these are huge companies. They're carrying a very large majority of the business in the reinsurance markets. I wanted to spend some time now uh, talking about the reasons that reinsurance makes sense. And there are four that I'd like to focus on. These are not the only four, but from the academic perspective, these are the top four. The first one is tax arbitrage. The second one is a substitute for capital. The third is earnings smoothing, which is important for some firms, not for all and then real services efficiency. I'm gonna dig into each of these four. These are inspired by a paper by Myers and Smith uh, published in the Journal of Business in the early 1980s. Uh, if you wanna go back and look at that, I'd be happy to provide the citation, but uh, I'm gonna to try to summarize what they say in that paper and then confirm based on uh, analysis of reinsurance company data and primary insurance company data uh, later. So what do we mean by tax arbitrage? Tax arbitrage means that the primary insurer has to pay taxes, state, federal, taxes, and if the primary insurer faces a particular tax function based on the, the tail of their business and things like that, they might get an advantage by letting someone else pay that tax and taking the tax deduction or the deductible expense from their, down, from their income state. So if the reinsurer is in a tax shelter do, uh, domicile, they might be able to avoid or shift or uh, defer taxes in a, in a way that would add value to their shareholders. And so if you see a lot of reinsurance based in Bermuda or the Cayman Islands, for example, a lot of that is because of the uh, preferential tax treatment. That allows the primary insurer to take a tax deduction for the reinsurance expense and allows the reinsurer to defer or avoid or minimize their tax burden. And that can make sense for everyone. Even though reinsurance might be priced uh, higher than expected loss, 
the result of tax benefits might offset some of that increase. So that means that the tax position could reduce the overall reinsurance cost overall, and the total reinsurance cost, total reinsurance cost when considering all factors, would still be need to be lower than the primary insurer's tax burden. But we can combine this uh, tax advantage with other advantages as well uh, that can allow us to use reinsurance to increase capacity primarily because of the taxation issues. The second is a capital substitute. Now, um, this one is, I think, particularly appropriate when I'm looking at a group of regulators because I think that most regulators that I've talked to would say that one of their primary obligations to their constituents is to maintain the solvency of the insurance industry. Now, there may be market conduct issues as well. There may be other things that uh, insurance regulators are focused on with, with respect to how the insurance industry plays out. But most regulators I've talked to say that uh, among those responsibilities, insuring solvency is one of the biggest ones, which means that they want to ensure that every insurance company that's uh, authorized to write business in their state has to have enough capital to support losses in excess of expected loss, because that's what insurance basically does. And that means that they have to have minimum capital, right? Now, if an insurance company tries to carry enough capital to manage all of that loss and to provide that kind of cushion, it's going to be really hard, especially in low interest rate regimes, to make enough money to compensate their investors and to ensure solvency in the future. And so that low return prevents insurance or minimizes insurance profits, which makes it a less appealing investment, which makes it harder to raise capital, which makes it harder to sell insurance, right? Those are big issues that we might be concerned about. So if they can then, if an insurance company can get a reinsurer to absorb the low probability but high tail risk, the regulator may be satisfied that the presence of the reinsurance policy can substitute for capital, and as a capital substitute may actually allow the company to reduce their costs overall. And so if we can use reinsurance as a substitute for capital, and most uh, domiciles, I believe, allow that, and they've got some rules, and Bill might talk about that in a little bit, that can reduce the overall capital cost and boost, increase overall profitability for the insurer. The third is earnings smoothing. This is much more important for publicly traded insurers, although privately held insurers might be concerned about earnings smoothing as well. Essentially, when you look at an insurance company writing business, especially if they're a narrow focus, if they're focused on writing business in the Gulf states and they get hit by one big or two or three big hurricanes in one season, it can really wipe out the cash flows for a period of time, really depress their earnings. And that can cause some uh, some concern by investors in terms of whether the company is able to meet their earnings targets in the future. And therefore, having reinsurance help stabilize those earnings might make them a more uh, appropriate target for people to invest in, giving them more access to capital. And so the ability to, um, to sort of lay off risks that are highly correlated within the insurance company to a, an investor of some kind, owner of a reinsurance company or a catastrophe bond investor and allow the company to sort of maintain earnings, uh, smooth earnings over time and pass off some of those bumps uh, to a reinsurer who has other sources of capital. And that also reduces the need to raise new capital right after a disaster event, if I think, uh, you know, Katrina, Rita, Wilma type event or an earthquake that we just saw in Afghanistan overnight, not, not related to the American insurance industry. But a, an event like that could cause a company to have to go out to the market and borrow money or raise new capital right after they experience a significant earnings hit. And if you know anything about capital markets, you know that's the last time you want to be raising capital because that's when the investors are going to require the highest rate of return. So uh, this also, earnings smoothing can affect managerial compensation, uh, managerial incentives. If the, if the manager is incentivized by stock options, for example, they may be incentivized to do weird things when they're facing financial distress. The presence of reinsurance can relax some of those incentives because someone else is going to bear the cost those extreme events as well. And the last one is real services efficiency. When I first started studying reinsurance, real service efficiency didn't make any sense to me as, uh, as a reinsurance tool. Uh, but what I mean by real services efficiency, if I think about the primary insurance market, one reason that I buy insurance for uh, auto liability, for example, first of all, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania requires me to have it. Why do I buy a lot more insurance than the Commonwealth requires? Because if, I want, if I'm in an accident, I need to hire an attorney to represent me in a tort lawsuit. The attorney that I get is going to cost me $400 an hour. But the attorney that the insurance company has is going to cost $150 an hour, or something like that. That's a real services efficiency in primary insurance. So I look at uh, real service efficiency and reinsurance, and I said, it seems like this is just a risk transfer, right? Why is real services efficiency important there? And as I got into it, I understand that, first of all, in the face of a catastrophe, a reinsurer may, be, may very well have uh, 
uh, event-specific claim services that they can provide. And they have an incentive to do so because they can reduce the claims to the reinsurer. So if I think about a hurricane response, for example, if the reinsurer knows how to deal with hurricanes and has the scale to deal with hurricanes, much more than the primary insurer has, that can reduce costs for them. Okay? So that's on the back end. On the front end, reinsurers have an incentive to invest in catastrophe modeling. What, what, how do we actually sort of figure out what the frequency and severity of, of wind risk is? What's going to be the actual damage associated with residential properties whose roofs are blowing off? How can we help an insurance company facilitate a loss control program for their insurers that can reduce overall costs for the insurance company overall? And the reinsurer taking on that tail risk is actually more concerned about mitigating those risks than the primary insurer. And because they're more concerned, they have an incentive and they have economies of scale to do so. And so reinsurance then can generate real services efficiency as well. And then uh, some work that I have done also on looking at repeated contracts, the more often an insurance company writes with the same reinsurer, the more that reinsurer can trust the underwriting files that they're sending to them, and that can reduce costs overall. So this sort of idea of repeated contracting, uh, a long series of claims history, and actually reduce costs for reinsurance overall, and that can generate real services efficiency as well. So those are the four reasons for reinsurance. Let's take a, just a pause for a moment and look at some uh, facts about the reinsurance industry, some things that I find particularly compelling. Uh, one is that about 2% of global life insurance is reinsured. Seems like that's not very much, but when we look at our actuarial tables, they've been very well developed over the past 30 or 40 years. It seems like we have a pretty good understanding of what mortality risk looks like, and reinsurance may be less important, unless the company is sort of focusing on a particular market segment that has a lot of exposure. Um, but about 10% of global property and liability and, and auto insurance is reinsured. So that's a pretty significant amount. Hurricane Katrina without reinsurance would have wiped out 12% count of American insurers. 12% of them would have been gone without the use of insurance. And uh, it would have wiped out one third of the capital of almost a quarter of US insurance companies. So reinsurance played a very important role in the Katrina we read a Roman year. Um, global combined ratios have averaged between 91 and 98%. So reinsurance is uh, being underwritten in a profitable way overall. I'll take a look at a chart later on if it's an idea of what that uh, scale looks like. And uh, as you saw on the, on the table previously, about $200 billion of premium in the, in the world. So some fast facts, take a little break from didactic stuff. But I'd like to look now at some terms, some things that uh, if you haven't spent much time on reinsurance, you come across terms like this, and it will help to put it in perspective on what these actually mean. Facultative, treaty or obligatory, pro rata, excessive loss, non-proportional, and rate online. So let's talk about each of these in turn. Facultative reinsurance comes on a case-by-case -case basis. The reinsurer can accept or refuse the, to um, underwrite that particular risk. The primary insurer can choose whether to see the risk or not. And so uh, if we take a look at this company, for example, housed in this building. In the facultative reinsurance, they could reinsure the building or some particular peril for the building. They could also reinsure liability associated li with uh, premises liability, operations, recalls, things like that. They could also underwrite workers' comp on a reinsurance basis. And the reinsurer can pick and choose which one they're willing to underwrite, and the primary insurer can pick and choose which one they actually want to shift the risk on. So this is for a really fine-tuned uh, point-by-point reinsurance where the insurer wants to sort of isolate a risk and take that risk off their books and send it off to the insurer in exchange for premium. So on the opposite side of that, uh, we have treaty or obligatory. This is where an insurer takes an entire portfolio of risks and cedes all of that business to the reinsurer. The reinsurer can only say we're gonna accept the portfolio or reject it. We can't look inside that portfolio and determine we want this part, but not that part. It's a whole book of business. I have a fleet of automobiles here because auto fleets are primary candidates for um, uh, treaty insurance. We're gonna, we're gonna underwrite this entire fleet of vehicles. The losses, loss profiles in each of those vehicles are similar. The types of drivers for these vehicles is relatively homogeneous. And so we can look at that entire block and say, we, we understand what that risk is. We understand how to price that risk. Um, so it's automatically renewed. The primary insurer cannot choose to underwrite just a portion of it, uh, like just these vehicles. They can, however, and we'll talk about this when we get to pro rata, they can choose to underwrite a percentage of it, but not individual risks. So we're looking at, the whole. So we're looking at um, a facultative or treaty as sort of two possibilities. Now, within each of those categories, within faculty and within treaty, 
that will tell you that within treaty, we have pro rata and excess of loss. So in pro rata, the reinsurer covers a specified percentage of insurance losses. We're gonna take, for example, 25% of our portfolio and transfer that to the reinsurer. Uh, based on a percentage of primary premiums written, the reinsurer will often see the commission back to the seating insurance company to help them with underwriting costs. Um, it comes either as quota share or surplus. Quota share is we're gonna take a certain percentage of all your losses. You're gonna give us a certain percentage of all your premiums, work it out that way. Or there's surplus where we sort of uh, say above a certain level, an attachment point, then we're gonna take some portion of the loss. So that leaves the insurer with a big uh, nut at the beginning and then the reinsurer can pick up after that. The pro rata on the other side, excess of loss or non-proportional. This can come in a couple of ways, but in this, at this level, the reinsurer covers part or all of the losses above a certain point. Um, this features lower administrative costs, lower claim settlement costs, because the reinsurer is not getting involved in lower level losses or losses below an attachment point, depending on how the policy is written. One way we can do that is excess of loss per risk. So we can say for a particular peril, a particular hurricane, or a particular windstorm, or a particular flood, we might say that uh, for each flood, we're gonna have an attachment point. If you hit that attachment point, then the reinsurer will take over. Or it can be stop loss, we have an annual or a policy period deductible. Once that deductible is hit by the insurer, then the reinsurer takes over. Uh, those stop losses are usually limited to really large loss type of events. That's the kind of policy that the reinsurer would very rarely pay out on, but when they did pay out, the, insurer, the primary insurer would find themselves in a much better position. So non-proportional and uh, pro rata. So with that in mind, I want to take a quick look at a couple of um, alternatives to reinsurance that have emerged in the last decade or two. Uh, this simple figure shows us what a catastrophe bond looks like. A catastrophe bond I think of as quite similar to a reinsurance policy with the exception that a cap bond is very specific about the peril and the trigger. So rather than looking at excess of loss or pro rata or facultative, what this cap bond is basically denominated on is whether a particular catastrophe happens at a particular time. And the payout is determined by how the bond is written. It could be a payout that's based on the actual losses of the insurer or the uh, sponsor of the bond uh, identifies. Or it could be based on a parameter, a set of parameters, right? So I'll talk about one in a couple of minutes that has to do with volcanoes and parameters of volcanoes that, uh, that might indicate what the payout would be. Basically what we have here is that the, the issuer, which would be a, a, an insurer or maybe a reinsurer, issues or, or builds up a special purpose vehicle, a subsidiary. That subsidiary then recruits capital from investors. So investors send money to the subsidiary. The issuer sends premiums to the subsidiary the subsidiary takes all of that money and invests it in a short-term low-risk security, like a treasury bond, used to be live or some European equivalent. That short-term security pays back uh, dividends or coupons to the special purpose vehicle, and the uh, insurer gets all, the issuer gets all of that, the investor gets all of that back unless a designated catastrophe happens. And if a designated catastrophe happens, some or all of the funds from the special purpose vehicle will then flow back to the insurer. So why would we do this? As an issuer, a sponsor, a primary insurer or reinsurer, or sometimes even a corporation, I might not want to expose myself to the ebbs and flows of the reinsurance market. But I might have a set of investors that's looking to add some diversification to their portfolio by exposing themselves to uh, East Coast wind risk. And if I wanted to, as an investor, get some exposure to East Coast wind risk, meaning that I get a lot of payoff when there's no hurricane, but I'm willing to suffer a loss when there is a hurricane that hits the East Coast, I would invest as an investor in the special purpose vehicle. My compensation for that is the low rate of return plus whatever premiums the uh, issuer, the sponsor, pays into that special purpose vehicle. These will then all flow back to the investor. Unless there's a catastrophe, then some or all of the proceeds of the special purpose vehicle flow to the issuer, the sponsor. So I like these ideas as a way to sort of avoid some of the agency conflicts that insurers and reinsurers might have, but it doesn't remove all agency conflicts and it can add some basis risk. Now, let me talk about basis risk in a couple minutes. This is an idea of what cap bonds look like uh, in terms of what perils are being covered by cap bonds uh, in the US and international. Uh, about 40% of all cap bonds are issued for multiple perils. You might have earthquake and tsunami and fire risk all in one bond. Um, North Carolina multi-peril and U.S. named storms occupy about 25%. Uh, 
right here, we have U.S. earthquake risk at about 20%. So you can see some of the big hitters. All of these in, uh, data are taken from Artemis.vm, which is a great site if you're interested in cat bonds. See listings of deals and summaries of what is currently outstanding in the cat bond market, which I think is a potential replacement for um, reinsurance for the right purposes. And uh, these are cat bond triggers. Uh, more than half of cap bonds are issued to pay out based on what the insurance company or reinsurer actually uses. That's an indemnity bond. Uh, about uh, a quarter of the cap bonds pay out based on what the industry loses. So they look at all the industry payouts from a storm or earthquake, and they pay uh, some uh, function of that to the insurer. And then everything else is kind of uh, smaller than that. The parametric being uh, looks like about 10 to 12 percent. And if it's parametric, that basically means we're going to have a payout that's based on actual parameters of the event that actually happened. And here's an example of that. Do not read is, I think, one of the most fascinating cat bonds that's been issued, uh, issued by the Danish Red Cross a couple years ago. And it's a very small, it's only $3 million of coverage, which is tiny in the cat bond market. But what I really like about this is that if I think about the Red Cross, I think about two things. One is collecting blood. The other is collecting money from donors when catastrophes happen. And soliciting donations, as you know, is a pretty expensive deal, You're kind of pulling on uh, people's affinity for certain organizations or uh, things that they might be concerned about and asking them for money. The problem with donations is you either have to do it prospectively and hold that money and find a place to put it and deploy it, or after the fact, it's going to take you a while to collect. And so the Danish Red Cross is trying out this cap bond as a substitute for raising capital after an event. And the way that Do Not, do not by the way, is the founder of the Red Cross. It's named for him. The way this works is that they have 10 named volcanoes around the world. And if a volcano happens at one of those 10 locations, they will measure the ash plume height and the wind speed. And depending on how the ash plume height and the wind speed are likely to affect an area where the Danish Red Cross could respond, this bond will pay out immediately with a, with a uh, cryptocurrency payment. In the what I really like about this is that there's no time delay. As soon as the incident happens, the Red Cross gets a payment. If the incident never happens, the investors in the cap bond, they get paid at the end with a premium. All right? This is a very simple example of the kinds of things that cap bonds can cover. Uh, this is the first one that's been used by a non-government organization for relief purposes. And this is the first one that pays out in a cryptocurrency. And so one example of a cap bond that I wanted to illustrate. All right, last term, and it's almost time for me to turn this over to Bill. Uh, rate online is a metric that's used to evaluate what the relative cost of reinsurance is. And it's the uh, premium paid divided by the limit that is associated with the bond. Guy Carpenter has an index that measures these over time. Um, I thought the screen would be a little bit bigger. This year right here is 1992 when um, uh, uh, Hurricane Andrew hit. And so uh, reinsurance prices spiked at that point before coming back down slowly. In 2001, after the September 11th attacks, they spiked, came down a little bit until 2004 when the Katrina Rita Wilma, uh, that was 2005, spiked again, and then has continued to trend downward. Although since about 2015, it's been going up slightly after that. So when you hear about rate online, it's simply a reflection of the amount of premium paid divided by the coverage that's provided. So I want to talk real quickly about four examples of the use of reinsurance. The first three are actually the use of government uh, entities or government private partnerships in providing reinsurance coverage. The first is after the Northridge earthquake that achieved uh, about $15 billion in losses in 1994 dollars. This was a total of all premiums collected for earthquake over 30 years. Uh, after the uh, Northridge earthquake, insurers exited the markets and what used to be an endorsement added to homeowners policies became an exclusion. And so the California Earthquake Authority was established as a way for private public partnership to work together to cover earthquake risk for, for properties that were exposed. Um, they can pay up to $10 billion in claims, and they're using reinsurance, and they're using contingent capital arrangements like catastrophe bonds, and then they're also assessing insurers to participate in the cost of providing this kind of coverage. So one use of reinsurance. The second is terrorism. Uh, perhaps more recent in our memories, after the September 11th attacks happened, the property insurance industry basically locked up, especially in urban areas. And a bunch of insurance executives met together with President Bush and members of his cabinet to uh, work out a plan that would allow the federal government to step in and provide a reinsurance backstop. 
Uh, so it became a public-private partnership where the federal government would participate only when huge losses were incurred. And as the as uh, TRIA, the Ter Terrorism Risk Insurance Act, has been extended and renewed over time, the level of private ownership in the terrorism risk has increased slowly. But we have not yet reached a full market solution that President Bush and the cabinet have uh, identified as potential at this point. Right now, it's $100 billion available uh, in the federal government for uh, the insurance coverage in the case of terrorism. The third is flood insurance, again, a government program. Uh, that supports the flood, National Flood Insurance Program and FEMA. Uh, National Flood Insurance Program uses 25 different reinsurers to provide a billion dollars in coverage, and they pay a total premium every year of $150 million. And that has reinsurers taking a little bit more than one quarter of the losses between four and eight billion from a single event. And um, this reinsurance program is intended to reduce the need for the National Flood Insurance Program to raise money for treasury issues. The very last one, longevity risk. Uh, life expectancy increases. That means that uh, providers of pension funds where they exist continue to take on more longevity risk. Longer people live is actually bad news for pensions. So the use of uh, reinsurance uh, allows companies that are not yet prepared or can't work with their organized labor to achieve a defined contribution program that shifts that risk to their employees to allow them to purchase bulk annuities and use a bulk annuity as a reinsurance program to fund long-term pension plans. Uh, and then using reinsurance to shift some of that risk to capital markets as well. So in conclusion, uh, insurance increases underwriting capacity, diversification uh, takes tail risk and allows the reinsurers to spread that among their investors. There are many different forms, pro rata, excess of loss, facultative and treaty. Reinsurers, because of their exposure, have become leaders in uh, global uh, financing and product innovations. So let me bring this back to where I started. I don't know if you read The Merchant of Venice in high school or college, I did, and I've recently rediscovered how wonderful it is. It turns out that Antonio, the Merchant of Venice, is approached by his friend for a loan that Antonio cannot provide because all of his money is tied up in ships at sea, right? So he arranges to pledge for a loan from a, a loan shark, really, named Shylock. And Shylock says, sure, I'll give you the loan. But it turns out Antonio had said some nasty things about Shylock in the past. And so Shylock said, I will give you the loan. I don't even want any interest. But if you can't pay me back, write it down in the contract, I want a pound of your flesh from closest to your heart. So good, you know, my ships are at sea. I know they're going to come in at some point. Even if they don't all come in, I'm going to be able to make good on this loan. Let's take the loan. He gives it to his friend to go off courting, to try to convince his, uh, his uh, lady friend that he has the best uh, capacity to take care of her with a loan borrowed from Antonio through Shylock. It turns out that the ships don't come in in time, and Shylock says, contract, you take a pound of your flesh, and it sort of sets up a sham court in which one of the, in which the, the beloved of his friend actually dresses up as a, as a male attorney and comes back and says, okay, you can take your pound of flesh, but if you get a drop of blood, then you're gonna have a death penalty because a death penalty for drawing blood. And Shylock says, how, how can I take my pound of flesh if I can't, uh, can't get any blood? So, well, that's up to you to figure out. But if you can't do it, then we're going to have to negate the contract, right? It turns out that uh, in the end, because of his plotting to kill Antonio, Shylock ends up being sentenced to death. However, Antonio says, hey, if you convert to Christianity, it's all good. So Shylock ends up converting to Christianity. But at the same time, Antonio's ships eventually come in, and his, all of his wealth is restored. And he gets half of, on, half of Shylock's possessions because of the settlement. So the story comes back full circle. All of my ventures are not a one bottom trusted. I can take some risk along the way. Sometimes that risk might turn out bad for me. I've got to rely on the legal system to make it good for me. But the ships, enough ships will come in if you have enough ships out of sea. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bill, to talk about some of the um, uh, regulatory impacts. A couple of my resources. Uh, Peter Bernstein, Against the Gods, fantastic book, highly recommended to you. Uh, some other sources that are also helpful, and uh, those are uh, available for your reference. So, off to Bill. Okay, good morning, everyone. So, I've been on the regulatory front for basically most of my career. I've been commanding the department for 28 years. All on the field examination side. Any field examination? Oh, all right. 
before that, I worked for New York for about a year, and I worked for a couple of reinsurance companies at college. So one thing I've learned about reinsurance when I work for reinsurance is nobody knows what reinsurance is. Because if you get a claim, you go to your insurance company. It's all behind the scenes. So I should say I should work for a reinsurance company. I'm going to blank there. So I just started saying I work for insurance because the public doesn't know about insurance and they don't need to know. You just worry about getting paid from your insurance company. So that's one of the first things you'll learn about reinsurance. On the regulatory side, it's, it's really a key area that we look at on the regulatory side. There is one big topic going on right now. You know, no, on the regulatory side, it's credit for reinsurance. There's some big changes going on. And I see someone from Missouri, one of your directors, John Dean, is one of the experts on the credit for reinsurance. That is the number one topic in reinsurance on the regulatory side by far. And we'll get into that a little bit. A little bit about the accounting reinsurance and the, with the analysis and we do our examinations. And we'll just close out to talk a little bit about the NAIC, what they do on the reinsurance side. So, but before we start, I thought it, it might be a good idea to give kind of three real world examples that we've seen in Connecticut over the years how important reinsurance could affect the company. Just a couple of quick examples. A number of years ago, we had a PC company, a mutual company that was a homeowner's company. They, they were around for easily over 100 years. They were homeowners, but they also wrote homeowners in Florida on the coast, Florida, high risk area. They had the insurance, so they were okay. But when that area became very uh, critical, a lot of losses, reinsurance rates just skyrocketed. This is probably at least 10 years ago. So what happened? This company either had to do without reinsurance or they couldn't afford the reinsurance. So they were not gonna, they were not gonna make it. They were a small mutual company. So what they had to do is they, they were purchased by a larger company. Which basically saved the company. That company is actually still around. Just again, all because of reinsurance. Uh, another example, we have a life company who decide, they're a, they're a very big company, they're not a big company, they decided to write an annuity business where they guaranteed rates, I think it was 5%. So they were guaranteeing 5% and they were getting an investment of 1%. So they got into real trouble. They could, it, it could not, they, they stopped writing these, but they had it on the books and nobody was uh, surrendering these policies. So what did they do? They tried to get reinsurance. So they went to Swiss Re, they went to Berkshire, they went to all the top reinsurers and no one would give them reinsurance. Not because they were a bad company, they just weren't big enough. It just wasn't worth, you know, Warren Buffett's time on Berkshire or, or Swiss Re's time. So they had a real problem. They got purchased by a larger company. Again, kind of saved them, even though they were in good shape, the long-term prognosis wasn't great because of these annuities mainly. And the last example I'll give is, is a reinsurance company in Connecticut. Again, a very good company, no solvency concerns, but they wrote, or they assumed long term care business. I'm not sure if that was a topic or not. Uh, long term care had, is having a lot of problems out there. So they had, I think it was a billion dollar reserve, which, even though it wasn't a solvency concern, they, it, it prevented them from freeing up enough capital to go out and for other opportunities. So what they did through uh, regulatory approvals, they ceded the long-term care reserves to an affiliate who were much bigger than me. So what does that mean? They now have a net zero reserve on their books. It frees up some capital, gives them more opportunities. So just three examples that, that we've seen over the years. And this needed regulatory approval because these are intercompany transactions. But it made sense for both the Canadian company and the other state where this business was seated to. So anyways, I thought I should start with that. So let's go here. So the biggest regulatory initiation right now is this credit for reinsurance. So real quick history, I don't know if anyone has been familiar with NAIC model laws, what the NAIC will do they still have these proposed laws. I mean, NAC doesn't make laws. They just propose these laws, and the states have to go to their legislatures, usually, and they have to approve these to become law in their state. It's just done for uniformity purposes. Because obviously, one of the complaints of state regulation is 
you know, is not the uniform it should be. So this is a key area that the NEIC and the states work with is to create these model laws. And then there's model regulations which kind of support more, get more detail. So it's a, it's a process. You have to go to your state, you have to go to your legislature, they have to pass it, and then it becomes law in your state. So one of the model laws was model law 785, which has to do with credit for reinsurance. Uh, credit for reinsurance is probably the most important uh, accounting credit for reinsurance. What that does is, if you have a company, let's say, decides to cede 50% of their business to Swiss Re, let's say it's a billion in reserves, they can take a, they can reduce the reserve by 500 million because they're seeding this out. That's the credit that they get. So years ago, companies ran into problems because there wasn't really reinsurance, formal reinsurance contracts. So the companies were going under, companies took this credit, but there was no reinsurance to go to. So what happened was they passed this model law, I think it was in 1984. And this gave the guidelines on how you can, you can take this credit without getting penalized, basically. And these are just, and these are all in the model law, these are all in the exam's handbook, procedures manual, so you don't have to go look in the case of the model law. So it's all documented in the NSC documents. So. so there was, and this was for years, there was really two, two functions that we had as an examiner and analysis. Is a company authorized? In other words, are they licensed in your state? Or are they licensed in the state that you see to? Okay, then no problem. You can take this credit, there's no penalty. Another, where well, they, they can be accredited, meaning you have to follow some guidelines, you have to be licensed in the state, but again, they're considered authorized. So, on a field exam, we care about one thing authorized or not authorized. If you're not authorized, you have to post collateral. And then you, I think you see some examples down letters of credit, the trust, etc. So, it was very mechanical what we did on the analysis side. We would maintain these listings of who's authorized, who's not authorized. What lines of business are they authorized for? And that's how we did reinsurance in the past. We just worried about do they have enough collateral to meet the credit that they're given. And by far, literature credit was by far the biggest, the most popular form of collateral. That's where the bank guarantees the money, where um, we used to go, we used to actually pull letters of credit, we used to make sure they comply with the law. And if they did, then, then we accepted their uh, collateral. So that's the way it was for years. But there was always pressure from some parties that you're hurting these companies who might not be licensed or domiciled in the United States, but they're a good company. You're making them post millions of dollars of collateral. And it's really hurting these companies. That's the argument. So what happened was in 19, I think 2011, they opened up a model law, which is not an easy thing to do, because the NEIC and the commissioners, we talk about the NEIC and the commissioners, they decided to open up this model law to make collateral less restrictive. So that happened, I think, in 2011 or 2012. No, okay, we can stay on this page. <clears throat> so they they created what's called a certified reinsurer. Basically, there's very detailed information. It's all on the web. It's all on actually your state websites too. Basically, if companies meet these criteria, they can have reduced collateral or potentially have no collateral requirements. They have to have rating agencies. That's the NRS or all those are rating agencies. S and P, Fitch, etc. Uh, if they're highly rated, maybe they don't need any collateral. They have to have surplus minimums. So there's a whole checklist that a company has to go through to become certified. And there's a whole mechanic behind it. It has to go to the NEIC uh, subgroup, which we're talking about. The subgroup has to approve it. Then it gets passported to the states. So your state, in the analysis out there, if there's a license scenario, the license scenario then has to go through their checklist and say, okay, for this company, for this line of business, we will accept you as a certified insurer. You do not need to post collateral anymore. So that was a big change in 2012. And these are 
effective for one year. Every year, I, the lead state who does most of the work has to, I believe, go back to the working group and get approval to, to affect, to make it effective in the next year. So it's always an, it's an annual effective date. Okay, so that was a big change, but you know, still some pressures on the NEAC. They were not companies were still not happy. So what they did was they got the federal government involved. So after the, the uh, crisis in 2008, Dodd Frank was was created. You might have heard of Dodd Frank. Within that, they created the federal insurance office called FIO. So it was the federal government trying to get more into insurance. Which is, there's always a battle between the state and federal. Who should regulate insurance? So FIO decided to come up with an agreement with the European Union called the Covered Agreement to basically wipe out collateral for, for these companies if they meet the criteria. And FIO is part of the Treasury Department, so they actually, you know, they have some important uh, legs to stand on. So they did this. They gave this happened in 2017. They gave the states, if you don't do this in five years, we're going to take over. This part of the insurance, the collateral, it's going to it's going to, it's going to uh, take over state regulation for this piece. So, what did the NEIC do? They said, you know, we can't have this. So, what they did was the commissioners and the executive commission of the NEIC they opened up the model law again in 2019 to try and match the covered agreement, which created what they call the reciprocal juris jurisdiction. So, basically. If you get on this list, let's say you're in England and Bermuda, if you're on this list, if you meet this criteria, you don't have to post any collateral, zero collateral, and basically it's kind of in perpetuity unless something significant changes. So that's where we are now, is the NAIC is, is scrambling for the states to pass these laws, because they have to go back to every state to do this. And September 1st is a deadline. But the good news is, as of June, every state has passed the, model, the new model law. Uh, there's about five or six jurisdictions that have not yet. DC, Puerto Rico, those are part of the NEIC kind of uh, state regulation. But they're all in the process. So that's a, a huge development because the deadline is coming up. In addition, states had to pass the model reg separately. So not only did you have to go back to your legislative and pass the model law, you had to go pass the model reg for the second time, the third time. And as of June, about 44 states have done this. So I think Connecticut, we actually just did it in the last month. So long story short, we're in really good shape. We'll see it in September with the feds decide. But I think the states have done a, a really great job in passing this, this model law because it's not easy to do. Um, I know in, in August, it's going to be an NEIC meeting in Portland that you'll be able to call in. This is going to be one of the main topics in the reinsurance task force. So just something to think about. Uh, it changes kind of the way we do our examination work. Uh, once again, a lot of the emphasis goes to analysis. A lot of things have moved to the analysis area over the years. But uh, it's just a key, it's the number one by far uh, reinsurance topic that's going on right now. Because again, the feds have decided to get involved with this. So uh, that's kind of a big overview about just credit for reinsurance. If you go on your website, you'll see your state department website. You'll see the checklist that your state might have. Who's certified in your state? Who has it? Who's a reciprocal jurisdiction? Every state has to post this publicly, and and they, you'll even see the guidelines that states have to follow. I'm sorry, that companies have to follow to get on your particular state listed of either certified or reciprocal jurisdiction. So that's it for model laws. So hopefully, uh, I didn't go that too fast, but I just wanted to kind of go over what's the main topic that's going on at the NEIC. A couple other things we'll talk about is, again, if you haven't seen this yet, the two main statutory kind of principles that we follow on the reinsurance is from the NEIC written manual, the SAF 61, which is for life companies, and SAF, SAF 62, which is for PNC companies. So if you have any questions about statutory accounting, these are the two statutory counter pronouncements you would go to. And they detail everything you need to know about reinsurance accounting, transfer risk, a deposit accounting, which we'll talk about, the characteristics of reinsurance contracts. So always start with this statutory counter principle if you have any reinsurance questions. 
one item which you, you might get involved with, just you know, you actually an exam or the analysis side, is transfer of risk. The key, the key item within from the insurance contract is it has to have transfer of risk, meaning that the insurance company has to have the same risk as an insurance company. They can't, they have to have a chance of having a significant loss. They have to pay on time. They pay the direct companies. So there are specific guidelines that they have to follow for it to be considered reinsurance. If it's not considered reinsurance, they can't take credit. They just hit their income statement. It all becomes what they call deposit accounting, which is basically what cash account on your, on your balance sheet. So that is one of the key areas that we look at on the field and in analysis for intercompany agreements is do they have transfer risk? And sometimes you need a specialist for this because it can be, contracts can be very detailed. There can be provisions in there that might kind of try to circumvent the transfer risk rules. So sometimes you'll have to get a specialist involved. Just something to think about uh, for transfer risk. Characteristics of reinsurance contracts. Every contract has to have an insolvency clause or they can't take credit. If you ever see a reinsurance contract without an insolvency clause, then there's something wrong with that company because every company has one. The days of kind of these handshake agreements are over. The reinsurance is very structured now. So you, you'll always see an insolvency clause. And basically what that does is it commits the reinsurer to pay even if the direct company goes under. So some miracle, let's say State Farm goes under, this never happened. The re, if they reinsure business, that reinsurance company still has to pay their obligations. In that they can't just say, oh, this company went under, I can't pay. No. They have to have an insolvency clause. And there's other clauses, termination clauses, there's uh, settlement clauses. And you'll see if you ever look at the insurance contract, they're pretty structured. And actually, the examiner's handbook has an example, to the end, I think, of how you can even review a reinsurance contract. Make sure the, the proper provisions are. Uh, they also talk about disclosures. If you ever look at the notes of financials, the general interrogatories, there's always sections on reinsurance. Uh, we always tell our examiners, first thing you go to a company, just read the notes, read the general interrogatories. We learn a lot about the company. Uh, and there's, there's topics that are reinsurance, reinsurance recoverables. So always look at the notes, too. Uh, in terms of the statements on the annual statement, Schedule S for life companies has all the reinsurance information you need. It's broken up by assumed business, seated business, affiliates, unaffiliates. Uh, has all this financial information. And Schedule F is the PNC version. Schedule F actually is much more detailed, has more penalties involved in the in, in why, but basically property casualty reinsurance is, you know, it's much more, I guess, important in a way than life because of all the, the type of business that property casualty can insure, like I mentioned homeowners, Reinsurance is critical, but it can be critical for life business too. But, but they've always had P and C penalties more severe because that's one of the problems from years ago, where companies weren't getting paid by the insurer because they either they went under, they just didn't have the funds. So they set up these schedule that very detailed. But again, that's going to change significantly with these new credit and the lack of collateral. So we'll see how that works out. Okay, a couple of things. I guess most of you are, are, are you on the analysis side? Most of you, most of you guys. So. so you know about eyesight and you know, you know, eyesight. Uh, well, that's a valuable tool that the NEIC offers to regulators. It has all this information. You haven't seen it yet. You know, not yeah, only we'll see you tomorrow all day long. Great. <laughs> Thank you. So there are some mechanical issues in there that you can look at that every insurance could affect your iris ratios. You know, your Fast score, the, all these different metrics. Just to keep in mind, reinsurance can affect these scores. So you might have something out of a range of an Irish ratio, for example. Who do you reinsure? Maybe they're right too much unauthorized. So there's all these metrics that you can use that to help you kind of know your company. Doesn't mean if something's out of a range, your company's going to go unsolved. It just it could be a perfectly good reason. But it just helps you learn your company. So always keep the eyesight reports in mind. Uh, financial analysis handbook, you'll see that in eyesight. They'll go over the branded risks. Uh, you know, what for this company, what could be a key risk for reinsurance within this brand of risk? Probably the biggest brand of risk you'll see for reinsurance is the credit risk because it has to do with recoveries. So if you're doing your analysis, you do your RAR, your IPS, the 
creditors always keep the insurance in mind. Uh, you, might, you might have a company that, that doesn't have any insurance, but just keep that in mind. Is the insurance collectability is always potentially an important credit risk. Also, strategic risk. Know your company's strategy of the insurance. We do this in the field also. You know, are they, do they have proper reinsurance in the sense, you know, compared to their surplus? Do they have to document their strategy? Do they have a board approval? So oh, that's kind of the risk focused approach now that we do with reinsurance. We don't just do the tying in. How, what is your strategy? Is it properly approved? Does it make sense? So that's uh, a key element now that we do an analysis and an exam. Uh, the Holding Company Act, obviously, if you're anything involved with Form B's, intercompany reinsurance agreements have to be approved just like any other agreement. You know, in Connecticut, I think every state, we have to verify transfer risks. We do have the luxury of having some actuaries on board. So before it's approved, they look at these reinsurance treaties to make sure there's proper transfer risk. So you might get involved with that if you form these. Um, you also, which I know Ellie was here yesterday, what a valuable tool for you, for all of us, especially if you have significant reinsurance, they should talk about that even more. Do they stress for their reinsurance? What is their strategy? So all this information format, it's just all this valuable information, just keep reinsurance in mind because that's amazing. Because it can be, it can have a major impact on your companies. We don't approve non-affiliated agreements. Some states might, but you have every right to ask for significant agreements for an analysis. Doesn't mean you have to approve them, but if you see something significant going on with non-affiliated uh, reinsurance, you want extra agreement, you have every right to. Just keep that in mind. And I put captives, I mean, it's a big captive discussion, but you might see in your state, one of your companies is ceded to a captive, maybe in your state, maybe offshore. And a lot of it, they might be ceding reinsurance for a particular line of business, it's in tax benefits. There might be some reserve redundancies. You might have heard of Triple X Reserve, which historically created captives because it was pretty well determined that these are redundant reserves. So they created these captives. With supposedly principal based reserves, just to get rid of that, but we'll see. So I'm just bringing that in because you might see that in one of your companies you want to create a captive. So that's just some examples for analysis. On the exam side, like anything, we test controls over the reinsurance program. Uh, there are two critical risks, if anyone's familiar with the critical risks. Within the NEIC handbook, there are nine critical risks. Basically, means you have to look at this on exam. You have to go through the seven phase approach controls, you know, inherent risk, substantive test, et cetera. Reinsurance has two of the nine risks. One is uh, the adequacy of the reinsurance program, like we discussed, the strategy of the company. Uh, and the other one is just reinsurance reporting and collectability, again, the creditors. So, on exam or analysis, the company, we might realize. This is really not a critical risk. There's no reinsurance. So you can essentially not look at this, but you can't just say, company has no reinsurance, we're not looking at it. First of all, the accreditation team will nail you, and obviously supervisor might too. You have to, have a, you have to give a reason. Well, you know, they write short-term health business. It makes sense they don't have reinsurance. So if, you have, so if you don't look at a critical risk, you just have to document why you're not looking at it. But potentially, you'll be looking at these on exams for reinsurance. We mentioned transfer risk. So what do we do on the exam? First thing we do, like any control, what does the company do? Do they approve their reinsurance contracts? Who approves them? Is it a specialist that approves the transfer risk? So that's like any other control, we look at that first. We look at CPAs, right? CPAs will do their own transfer risk. So you have all this information on exam before you even really have to do your own independent review. But there still might be times that you want to do your own review of transfer risk, use of specialists. Sometimes, as I mentioned, on exam, you might realize, you know, this is an examiner, we don't have the expertise, we need a specialist. So you might have a reinsurance specialist, or any, anyone know maybe another specialist might, might help on the insurance? Actuaries, always ask your actuary. Uh, a lot of them have expertise in this area. We will actually contract out actuaries on larger exams, and we usually have someone on their exam, on their on their team as a reinsurance specialist. And we tell them these treaties look, we can't really handle these; they look very technical, 
you can take a look at this. Uh, other forms, which uh, Jim mentioned, you know, this cat bond, there's other forms of risk transfer that you might see during, during your career. So, uh, so just some examples that we do on analysis and, and exams. Uh, many other examples. Just again, just keep in mind the insurance when you're doing your companies. Just a few, this is actually the last slide. So there's a few things. RBC, keep that risk based capital. I'm sure you're familiar with that. Probably the key metric that state, company states use to see the capital level of the company. Uh, again, it's just one number, but it's really one of the most important numbers that you look at and that your supervisors, your chief examiners will look at for a company. Just put it in there to just know reinsurance first takes, certainly takes part in risk based capital. And some of the factors being trying to take a big part. So you might see your RBC go way down to the company. You have to find out why. Maybe they decide to write more reinsurance or unauthorized. So just keep in mind that for RBC, uh, reinsurance certainly might play in the RBC calculation. On the NEIC side, reinsurance task force is the main task force for reinsurance. Missouri is the chair. Anything related to reinsurance? will either start or be referred to the reinsurance task force. So if you have an opportunity to call into one of these meetings, certainly to try and call into the reinsurance task force. They're going to talk about all the credit that's going on. Underneath that is reinsurance financial analysis working group called RFOG, which is now the key group in terms of these uh, reciprocal and the certified reinsurers. Because co company states have to go to companies have to go to our flag or states do actually before they're allowed to accept certified and reciprocal reinsurance. So again, that is a key group that I think Colorado should share. I think Missouri used to be, I think Colorado shares that now. And one last key committee is a mutual recognition of jurisdiction working group. Which they, they have a couple of couple of charges, but again, they're involved with reinsurance, they're, they're responsible for determining if a jurisdiction is a qualified jurisdiction for certified or if they're qualified reciprocal jurisdiction under the company agreement. Like you see Bermuda, UK, the company Switzerland, I think is on that list. So that's what they do. They don't report directly to the reinsurance task force because they also do some group capital. But all these committees report to the E committee. The E committee, if you're not aware, they're the financial Win of the NESC working group. So, reinsurance task force reports to the E committee, mutual recognition of all, they all report to the E committee. So, this again, if you have ever a chance, I would definitely recommend if you can call into some of these and just try to learn from maybe the more senior uh, people in your, in your, in your uh, department. And the last thing is, again, the covered agreements. I don't know if I mentioned there's two, because obviously UK is not part of the EU. So, the UK, they have their own agreement with the United States Treasury. So, and again, the key is it requires states to eliminate collateral within five years or risk federal preemption, which again, I think we're, we're, we're okay. We'll know in September. In fact, that all the states have done this. I think they've done a great job. So I think we're going to be okay with that. We'll see. Uh, that's all I had. Hopefully, and it was too quick, but that's the main thing. Just think about credit for reinsurance and just always think about reinsurance when you're Thank you. The Institute's Griffith Insurance Education Foundation, the Insurance Regulator Education Foundation, and the Katie School of Insurance at Illinois State University were pleased to collaborate on this session. We thank Dr. James Hilliard, Associate Professor with the Fox School of Business at Temple University, and Mr. William R. Fonis, Division Director, Financial Regulatory Affairs with the Connecticut Insurance Department for their thought-provoking presentations. To learn more about Griffith Foundation program offerings, we invite you to visit www.griffithfoundation.org.